Good afternoon. I'm Jonathan Capehart, opinion writer for The Washington Post, and welcome to Washington Post Live. Derek Johnson is the 19th president and CEO of the NAACP, the nation's foremost civil rights organization. In addition to get out the vote efforts this fall, he's spearheading a new effort called We Are Done Dying and is calling attention to both the disproportionate impact of the coronavirus on the black community and the need for police reform. And here to talk all about it is Derek Johnson, president of the NAACP. Derek, it's great to see you. Good to see you. So um, I've now mentioned it three times, the hashtag we are done dying campaign. Talk about w what it is and what you're hoping to accomplish. Well, We Are Done Dying is a proclamation of action. Uh, it's not enough to promote uh, how public policy or health considerations are impacting our community. The real question for us is what are we going to do about it? Uh, in this moment of peaceful protests in the street, we clearly understand that nothing changes without public policy impact. So we have to move people from peaceful protests in the street, the ballot box in November, but leave from that power posture to ensure that policymakers implement public policy to address systemic problems in our community. And you know, you're the president of the NAACP, and there are a whole host of priorities that you have as the president of this organization, leader of that organization. We are done dying is part of that. With all of the things that that are on your plate, how do you prioritize? What's your what's your strategy going forward? Well, I, I assumed this position three years ago, and I understood clearly the role of the NAACP in this moment is to build our base across the country. We're an organization with 2,200 units in 47 states. Uh, the civic engagement uh, space is where we could be most effective. It could not simply be about the transaction of one election. It needed to be an arc of democracy, starting with the 2018 midterm elections, going to 2019 special elections, making sure we're prepared for the census, coming to the 2020 presidential, moving to redistricting in 2021, back to a midterm election. It is an arc of democracy. And for, and for me, it was about building an infrastructure so we can measure our work and, and outcomes to ensure success. You know, under, <coughs> under, under normal circumstances, um, the priorities that you have on your plate, the ones that you, you just talked about, are it's already a, a, a difficult mission that you have. Under normal circumstances with a normal presidential administration. How much of a challenge has the Trump administration been in terms of trying to achieve or at least make headway on the goals that you have? Well, this administration has been profoundly complicated. Uh, there are no rules that this administration, uh, that they're, un they're not unwilling to uh, uh, bridge. Uh, you considering elections, uh, because of the Holder Shelby decision, which undermines Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, we have now seen a regional problem that's been in the South to spread nationally where attempts to suppress the Black vote or the vote has, has in places like Wisconsin, uh, Philadelphia, and Nevada. And so as we adjust our program to turn out the Black vote, we also must account for efforts to suppress the Black vote and that's inclusive of, of platforms like Facebook. That's why we built out a campaign called Stop Pay for Profit, along with our partner organization. Uh, uh, this democracy has been stretched to the brink. It is the role of the NAACP and many others to push back as hard as possible so we can get back to a, a, a space where we are more familiar with and advance questions of equality. Have you had a, uh, any kind let me start again. Have you had a meeting with President Trump? No, uh, I refuse to give a photo op. It is our opportunity to talk about substantive policy opportunities, not to give this president a photo opportunity. I have yet to see him have a serious dialogue with any individual or group from the black community that truly represents the interests of the black community without it being turned into some type of photo opportunities and talking points. 
And, and so, I mean, one of the things that the president talks about is how much he's done for criminal justice reform and how much he's done as a result for the black community. You've had no kind of interaction or communications with the president or broadly speaking with anyone in the administration. So let, let's start with the first part of your question. It is offensive to say I've done a lot for the black community because I've done stuff with criminal justice reform as if that's a sum total of who we are and our experience as African Americans in this country. We need to talk about much more substantive, proactive, forward-looking opportunities. There were some outreaches by this administration uh, uh, concerning him speaking at our convention one year. I have sat down with Secretary of HUD, uh, Ben Carson, but for the most part, they, they have not been serious with engaging uh, the African American communities around substantive opportunities to move this nation, to move our communities forward. So the other thing that the president talks about a lot, I believe it's opportunity zones and how much that is helping the black community. So I take it from what you've just said, you've not even had any conversations with him or anyone in the administration about, about your views or counsel on that. No, I mean, we, we've talked to members of the Senate, both uh, Republicans and Democrats about opportunity zones, but this is not, a, <coughs> excuse me, this is not an administration that truly value input from communities or individuals who look different than them. This is not administration that have shown themselves having any interest of doing something that's not in the personal interest of the president and his family. And, and so we are in a different type of conundrum here. We have an individual who's a uh, reality TV celebrity who is masquerading as a business person sitting in the White House. It is not a healthy existence for us. And organizationally, our time is better spent preparing for this upcoming election than anything else. And I do want to talk about other things you're doing to get ready for the upcoming election. But I'm glad you mentioned um, uh, conversations you have had with folks on Capitol Hill, because I had already written down here as a note to remind myself to ask you, OK, so you haven't had a, a meeting with President Trump for understandable reasons. But what about Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell? Any kind of meetings that you've had with him or any kind of relationship that you have with um, folks on Capitol Hill that m make it possible for you to at least make some advancements on that the long list of priorities that you have? Absolutely. We've met, again, with members of the Senate of both parties. Uh, we have an ongoing dialogue and relationship with Senator Scott, who's been one of the leading architects behind, uh, behind our, uh, the Opportunity Zone. Uh, 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 Senator, Senator Mick Romney, he's actually participated in one of our Teletown Hall meetings where we have over 50,000 of our members from across the country to join. That was a very fertile, forward-looking conversation. Uh, we have not had a conversation with Mitch McConnell. Uh, uh, well, we've had conversations with several other members of the Republican Party in the Senate and Democrats. Um, okay, so now let's talk about the, the upcoming election. What concerns you most about, about the vote that we're, about, we're gonna have in less, than, in less than 50 days? Well, three things. One, I, I'm really concerned with the effort to suppress uh, the vote by uh, taking away polling places and all the other tricks that we may find out after the fact. Secondly, I'm extremely concerned with the intelligence report that foreign nations are still seeking to influence our elections and the fact that platforms like Facebook have done nothing uh, to ensure the integrity of our elections. And then thirdly, I'm concerned with the outcome of the election uh, being one in which it would take longer than we are used to, therefore, given this administration uh, to uh, seek to delegitimize the outcome of the election unless he, he sees himself as the winner. Um, you've mentioned social media and particularly Facebook a couple of times now, so let's just dive in there. <clears throat> Have you had any kind of conversations or the opportunity to speak directly with Facebook about your concerns about the social media platform's role in disinformation? Absolutely. For the last two years, uh, we have been in direct conversation with Facebook at the highest level, including uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, we are definitely concerned that this platform, this behemoth of a company uh, that's self-regulated, mind you, have refused to address the algorithms on their platform 
uh, that are being used by white supremacist groups to recruit members and carry out activities that are both harm and killed individuals. Uh, we've seen it in Kenosha, we've seen it with the Boogaloo group, uh, but they have yet to do anything to truly address the spread of racial hatred, anti-Semitic content on their platforms, and they have the tools and the ability to do so. Uh, in addition to that, they have refused to address uh, the spread of misinformation around the upcoming election on their platform in an aggressive way. Is there anything that the NAACP is doing to try? I mean, you're you're not Facebook. No one is Facebook. So trying to go up against the, the disinformation um, that's flowing through it is one thing. But is there anything that the NAACP is trying to do to try to counter the disinformation that's coming through on social media platforms? Well, absolutely. We have a, a very robust a digital strategy to talk directly to uh, the communities that can have the biggest impact on this uh, election in the African American community. Uh, we've identified the target states that we must operate in to increase Black voter participation. 2016 was a, a negative milestone for uh, uh, electoral politics for African Americans. It was the first year in 20 years that we've seen a decrease in Black voter participation. And so it's our goal to increase that number uh, by those individuals who we have identified as infrequent voters to get them out to vote this time through a relational organizing model. You know, one of the things that, um, that played into that sort of 20 year low in terms of black voter participation, uh, at least I've seen some commentators and other folks mentioning is that there was not <clears throat> as much enthusiasm for the, the, the Hillary Clinton, Tim Kaine ticket as there was for the previous Barack Obama, Joe Biden ticket. How much of an impact has Joe Biden, the current Democratic presidential nominee, his impact of, of, of choosing Senator Kamala Harris of California to be his running mate? Has that, from your vantage point, helped with the enthusiasm for the Democratic ticket? You know, from the day of the announcement that Senator Harris was going to be the running mate, uh, I've seen tremendous energy and enthusiasm from African-American women across the country. Uh, our D9 uh, members, uh, the sororities in our community, uh, and many other social groups all were excited. I received calls, text message. Uh, there was a marathon of, of a Zoom conversation with prominent women from across the country. It has generated a level of energy that, that's needed. But most importantly, we should never, as a community, rest uh, our ability to fully engage and participate uh, on individual personalities or a political party. It is incumbent upon African American communities to build out, maintain, and grow our mechanism to inform our community and ensure they get out to vote. We are nonpartisan. We don't support political parties or candidates, but it's absolutely important for NAACP and all of our partner organizations to focus on the infrastructure of civic engagement and not the candidates who are participating. You know, speaking of the, the, the infrastructure of, of civic engagement, one of those things that we've been hearing a lot of talk about, especially because of this uh, uh, election day, is mail-in voting. And, you know, African-Americans, like, you know, we like to show up at the polls. Like, we go stand in line. We do souls to the polls. We'll vote early. But the idea of voting by mail, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the African-American community is the least likely to choose mail-in voting. One, correct me if I'm wrong, if, if I've got that wrong. And two, what is the NAACP doing, if anything, to encourage African-Americans to vote by mail? Well, uh, it's our role to make sure individuals know the election laws in their individual state. Not all 50 states have vote by mail. Not all right. 50 states have early voting. So it is our role to make sure that African-American voters know the options that are available to them and they can be informed about the choices they make in terms of navigating this election cycle. Uh, one of the considerations that's on the table is a global health pandemic. And so some individual may need to figure out how to navigate this election and keep their health in mind. Uh, so we're not encouraging people to vote one way or the other. We are encouraging people to participate. And the best way we can do that is to allow them to see the options. It is true that African-Americans percentage-wise 
uh, vote at a lower percentage than others in terms of vote by mail, but it's absolutely necessary that however one chooses to vote, that we cast ballots in mass from the African American community this election cycle. You know, I'm glad you brought that up about the fact and reminding everyone that, you know, we've got 50 different rules for voting, uh, depending on the state that you're in, the rules for voting, how you can vote, and all the little picayune details that you have to, to put up with. And that leads to the larger issue of voter suppression. Is part of your effort, in addition to telling people, like, here are what the rules are, shining a, a light for them on here are the here are not only what the rules are, but here are the ways they're trying to keep you from voting. Absolutely. We had a, a long call this morning with the National Bar Association, that's the Bar of African American Lawyers, as they ramp up their program. We're working with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, uh, the Legal Defense Fund, the Advancement Project, all of our partner legal uh, nonprofit legal organizations, we are all standing ready along with our own legal department to address vote suppression, uh, both before the election is had, during the day of the election, and prepare to address uh, uh, infractions after the election. Uh, that has always been a part of our strategy. It's even more needed now than ever before, because if this democracy is truly going to be a representative democracy, we must open up access to voting and not allow uh, the administration of, of the voting process to be so politicized that we actually uh, decapitate the very uh, principles of a democratic elected government uh, that we proclaim across, across the globe, but not practicing here domestically. I have a, a couple more questions on voter suppression I want to ask you. One is, how concerned are you uh, about, election, uh, about election day? about the potential for the potential of the administration to i don't know utilize tactics that in, intimidate the vote or suppresses the vote in terms of using um, or giving a wink and a nod to uh, armed citizens or unidentified federal troops um, any concern on your part that that could happen but we are concerned with all of the above. Uh, this is an administration that have shown itself to have no limits uh, to try to retain power, uh, whether it's the actual administration, the, the Republican Party, uh, the uh, state Supreme Court. What we just witnessed in Wisconsin when they tried to stop the issuing of ballots to add a third party on the ballot, although that party did not uh, meet, the, meet the criteria. Everything is on the table. And that's unfortunate. I guess the notion of making America great again was making America 1950s again, where African Americans and other communities were uh, prevented from exercising uh, their right to vote. Um, one of those, an another suppression uh, effort, to my mind, is sort of the, the in some instances, Republican-backed efforts to support Kanye West and his run for the president, for run for the presidency. How concerned are you, or put it this way, what do you make of Kanye West's run for president? It's unfortunate uh, that he's operating in this space. I, I, I don't, I can never speak for another person's intent, uh, but this is an old school vote suppression method. Elections are won by inches, not miles. So there will be fractions of percentages that some, some elections are won by. And if he's able to qualify to get on ballots in certain areas, uh, it, it could, in fact, have an impact. Well, I recall vividly 1992, Ross Perot. I recall vividly what many believe took place uh, in 2006 with, uh, uh, with the uh, third party candidacy of, of uh, 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 Stein, uh, the Green Party candidate. Uh, uh, Fractions right. of percentages is where we are concerned about. And if it's done deliberately to pull off votes to give someone an advantage, uh, it is a vote suppression mat uh, 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 matter. Uh, and I'm, I, most of us should be concerned about uh, Kanye's mental state. Uh, either he's doing this as a joke or he's not stable. I'm running as a candidate for the birthday party. 
that's not a serious bid. And one would have to question why. Uh, and I just want to be clear, you were talking about the Jill Stein, who was a, a third yeah. party candidate in the 2016 presidential election. Uh, and I was also thinking of, of Ralph Nader and Ralph Nader, he, was in, yeah. he was in 2000. Um, let's talk about the civil rights mo moment that we're in right now. You as president of the, the probably most revered civil rights I institution in this country. From your perch, what do you make of the the civil uh, the the civil disobedience and the demonstrations that have um, reignited across the country in the wake of the death of George Floyd? Well, we we are in a, an inflection point, uh, much similar to sixty five years ago with the the open casting funeral of Emmett Till. Uh, there is an awakening. Uh, unlike Emmett Till, it took from nineteen fifty five and it began to really escalate in 1960, 61, 62 through 64, uh, because of the so social media, we don't have to wait that long. And we're seeing this inflection point where we're seeing peaceful protests in the street of individuals that look like America. We have young, old, black, white, male, female. Uh, it looks like America. It is an opportunity for us to determine what direction are we gonna go in? Are we gonna go forward into a future that's more inclusive, or are we going to go backwards? So we have to move people from the peaceful protests in the street to the power at the ballot box with that value proposition that Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter is a factual statement. It's more than just a hashtag or an organization or a set of individuals. It's a factual statement. And that statement is a value proposition that we must carry forward because if the lives of black citizens uh, is, is disregarded, none of our lives are important and will matter in terms of the social contract the constitution gives us that all men and women are created equal and then endowed with certain inalienable rights, that equal protection of law should be afforded to all of us. And that's what that, that factual statement represents. And when we take that value proposition to the polls and we are successful for those policymakers, they must carry that, that proposition to public policy implementation so we can address systemic and structural racism that have dogged this nation for decades, so we can address inequities wherever it exists, so we can address how that social contract would impact all of us, not only African Americans, but all of us. I want to continue down down this road and bring in a question from from a viewer, Eileen Matthews from Maryland, and she asks, "Are the Black Lives Matter protests an extension of the civil rights movement, or is it a new movement? How can we best utilize or perhaps bring together the wisdom of the elders in the NAACP with the energies of the young involved in Black Lives Matter protests?" Yeah, you know, it's a wonderful question. And I have had a lot of experience with veterans of the civil rights movement. In fact, uh, from 2011, 2013, 14, and moving forward, the group of young people who first identified as Freedom Side, uh, we began to meet with elders of the civil rights movement. Uh, and, it was, and it was a beautiful set of gatherings, uh, 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 one of which went at Duke and at MIT, at Tougaloo College, my alma mater. We were bringing young people from across the country together, along with the elders of the civil rights movement. And the very notion, the very factual statement of Black Lives Matter is a statement that was being made in 1960 by organizers of the SNCC movement. So the statement Black Lives Matter isn't a new statement. It has been repopularized uh, by social media and the wonderful three ladies who, who created the hashtag. Uh, so it's definitely an extension. There is a continuity of movement. The other thing that's a misnomer, there is no us versus us, young versus old. That is something that we must move away from. Movements are only successful if they're intergenerational. It's the energy of our young people, it's the wisdom of the elders, and it's the continuity of those who are between both young and old. That's the ingredients of a successful movement. If you look at John Lewis, it wasn't about him as a student. It was a whole infrastructure that informed and supported him and Corlin Cox and Stokely Carmichael and, and Diane Nash and a ton of other individuals. Movements are, are not egocentric. It's not about the one leader. It's about the community as a whole. And all of the successful uh, movement programs, 
that turned out to be successful wasn't about the individual, the charismatic leader. It was about the efforts and energy of the whole community. Uh, one more question from, from a viewer, Derek. This is from Felicia Madrigal from Oregon. She asked, if you could ask your listeners to do just one thing to improve civil rights for everyone, what would that be? I recently saw the movie, The Social Dilemma, about the negative effects of social media on society. What should we do to reduce social media's widening of the differences slash divides between people? So first of all, I don't know if there's anything we can do about social media as individuals, uh, because some of that must be embedded in our public policy and regulatory oversight. Uh, social media is here. It allows for people uh, to receive information in ways in which it has been uh, uh, democratized. And, and, and so we are in the early stages of that. I think Ferguson and Trayvon Martin showed the power of social media where anyone with a smartphone became an instant reporter at that moment. That's a beautiful thing, but a dangerous tool if there are no guardrails in place. Uh, individuals should be engaged using organizational vehicles that are comfortable to them. Social justice isn't a competition. So if, if it's NAACP is the organizational vehicle you wouldn't use, we invite you. If it's color change, we, we invite you. If it's, if it's LDF, you name the organization. <clears throat> It is important for all of us to add our voice to the social justice movement. One final point, you know, a good friend of mine, David Johns, he has uh, the National Coalition of Black Justice, it's a black LGBT organization. And, and we had a lot of people talking about the trend of black trans women being killed and no one is saying anything about it. I say, David, what do we need to do? And he can't be because we're good friends. He said, you know, Derek, sometimes I need to lead that voice. But sometimes you need to lead it. I'm using that example. Sometimes we need to figure out the best vehicle to penetrate the message because it is the message, is the value that's embedded in the message that's more important than the organizational vehicle that's being used if we truly want to pursue equity and justice in this country. Derek, we've got two minutes left. So I'm going to ask you this last question because it requires a little bit of thought, and that is my, my um, I've been looking at this election as a choice, not so much between President Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden, but as a choice between American democracy and white supremacy. On that, uh, on that choice, where do you think America will land on election day? You know, the way you put it, that's an inflection point that we are in for far too long white supremacy have driven American democracy. This is that moment where we can decouple uh, the concept of white supremacy reigning supreme over our democracy. It is an opportunity and a choice that we must make. This inflection point will determine the direction. I believe that with all of the energy of the peaceful protesters in the street, who by extension are truly protesting against white supremacy when they proclaim Black Lives Matter in Portland or Seattle, where there's a fraction of percentage of the protesters actually looking like either you or me, they are saying that we must uh, denounce white supremacy. When we partner with our friends in the Jewish community who understand the impact of anti-Semitic behavior, that is a choice that we must denounce white supremacy. When we have uh, women who say, you know what, I don't want my child to grow up in a society that allow otherness or tribalism, that is our a way to denounce white supremacy. So November's election is an opportunity for us to make a choice to pick democracy, true representative democracy, and decouple this concept of white supremacy that has been embedded in our democracy for far too long. And with that, we're gonna have to leave it there. Derek Johnson, president and CEO of the NAACP, thank you very much for coming on Washington Post Live today. And just know, Jonathan, I put my pocket square in just for you. <laughs> Very good. And nice line. Very nice yeah. line. <laughs> Great to see you, Derek. Thank you. And thank you for tuning in to Washington Post Live. Next week, we have a packed schedule of programming, including interviews with former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights Michelle Bachelet, and former FBI Director James 
Comey. You can register to watch these interviews and more at WashingtonPostLive.com. I'm Jonathan Capehart, opinion writer for The Washington Post. Thank you very much for tuning in to Washington Post Live.